it's good to be here again. Uh, and the story that I have to present is very different than what I presented 40 years ago when Dr. Haynes asked me to write a white paper about the state of Christianity in the city. Because at that point, Christianity was less than uh, about 3% and had been declining for four decades. And uh, we were anticipating if this, de this decline that had been going on for decades continued, what would actually happen to the city? We desperately needed a revival. The amazing thing is, one came! <laughs> and unfortunately, uh, not of any of us seen it. <laughs> and uh, because it was 3% when I spoke here about in Christian, now there's over 14% that are Christians in this city. And, uh, and so it's a dramatic change uh, since Dr. Haynes asked me to speak. And uh, now our, our, my good brother, David Wright, has asked me to come as well. And uh, so anyway, uh, we're going to uh, then look briefly. Uh, of course, the text is very much uh, in line with everything that this group is about. In fact, I'll read it to us. It says, I tell you the truth, Jesus said, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And your whole point about here uh, is to do the greater things in Boston. And this is all about the greater things that Jesus has done. Okay? And uh, so we're going to start. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how many times that you have listen to Wolves Howl in Park Street Church, but we're going to start with that. One of the most exciting scientific findings of the past half century has been the discovery of widespread trophic cascades. A trophic cascade is an ecological process which starts at the top of the food chain and tumbles all the way down to the bottom. And the classic example is what happened in the Yellowstone National Park in the United States when wolves were reintroduced in 1995. Now, we, we all know that wolves kill various species of animals, but perhaps we're slightly less aware that they give life to many others. Before the wolves turned up, they'd been absent for 70 years, but the numbers of deer, because there was nothing to hunt them, had built up and built up in the Yellowstone Park, and despite efforts by humans to control them, they'd managed to reduce much of the vegetation there to almost nothing. They'd just grazed it away. But as soon as the wolves arrived, even though they were few in number, they started to have the most remarkable effects. First, of course, they killed some of the deer, but that wasn't the major thing. Much more significantly, they radically changed the behavior of the deer. The deer started avoiding certain parts of the park, the places where they could be trapped most easily, particularly the valleys and the gorges. And immediately, those places started to regenerate. In some areas, the height of the trees quintupled in just six years. Bare valley sides quickly became forests of aspen and willow and cottonwood. And as soon as that happened, the birds started moving in. The number of songbirds and migratory birds started to increase greatly. The number of beavers started to increase because beavers like to, to eat the trees. And beavers, like wolves, are ecosystem engineers. They create niches for other species. And the dams they built in the rivers um, provided habitats for otters and muskrats and ducks and fish and reptiles and amphibians. The wolves killed coyotes and as a result of that, the number of rabbits and mice began to rise, which meant more hawks, more weasels, more foxes, more badgers. Ravens and bald eagles came down to feed on the carrion that the wolves had left. Bears fed on it too, and their population began to rise as well, partly also because there were more berries growing on the regenerating shrubs. And the bears reinforced the impact of the wolves by killing some of the calves of the deer. Here's where it gets really interesting. The wolves changed the behavior 
of the rivers. They began to meander less. There was less erosion. The channels narrowed. More pools formed. More riffle sections, all of which were great for wildlife habitats. The rivers changed in response to the wolves. And the reason was that the regenerating forests stabilized the banks so that they collapsed less often, so that the rivers became more fixed in their course. Similarly, by driving the deer out of some places and the vegetation recovering on the valley sides, there was a soil erosion because the vegetation stabilized that as well. So the wolves, small in number, transform not just the ecosystem of the Yellowstone National Park, this huge area of land, but also its physical geography. And this uh, is, is the basis, I believe, of how revival works. The first major Christian revival was the one in the New Testament. Jesus Christ in the Gospels was the keystone. And as we read in the text, and as we observe in this meeting here, he said to all his disciples, what? Greater things will you do than I have done. He was to be a keystone, and then he was to leave, and what happened? The, uh, the, the whole thing began to change. The church began to grow, and uh, dramatic things, and church um, without car uh, cars, uh, cars or automobiles or internet reached the then known world within about a generation. It was unbelievable, the rapid growth and, of the ecology. And so this uh, then is a, is a symbol of uh, the, the reason it works in the natural world is because God determined it redemptively that this is how things work. You start with a keystone and you go into a cascade. And Christ made it very clear that he would not do it, we would. And it had to be indigenous to uh, the culture of our world and he had to leave so that we could do it. And so uh, a, a true revival has these two elements. A keystone and a cascade, okay? Now, Boston is a city of revivals. We have had revivals here for about 220 years. Uh, and uh, almost a revival every generation or so has happened in this uh, city. And, uh, and many of times that we look at these revivals, uh, we focus on the keystone which are the great preachers and the big gatherings and all that sort of thing. And uh, usually that lasted uh, sometimes months and sometimes two years. But that was the keystone. Now, in many of these revivals, they did have cascades that resulted from them, but they were not well documented. The whole thing of women's rights and uh, issues of slavery and so forth came out of some of the early revivals. But this stuff was not documented. But this is, this is the critical thing. You have a keystone, and which is symbolic of Christ himself, and the cascade, which was the early church. And, and so it is here that uh, we had this. Now, I was uh, uh, at a meeting about 75 years ago, similar to this uh, time of year, and, and I was in a meeting where there were all kinds of uh, pastors. I think there was about um, several hundred pastors meeting in a meeting in Sturbridge, Mass., I don't know, does anybody remember this meeting? But anyway, uh, what happened was, we were all pastors there, and all of a sudden, the Spirit of God came in a dramatic way. It had been almost a generation since we'd had any major revival, and we were ripe for one. And it seemed like it was happening. Everybody was moved by the Spirit of God in an enormous way. It was palatable. You could taste and see and feel. And pastors started confessing sin to other pastors. It was a real movement of God, and it was dramatic. And then everybody's wondering, well, where does this go? And then somebody got up and said, you know, this is wonderful. Let's try to do this, organize it, and do it all over New England. 
it stopped immediately. <laughs> so you had a keystone without a cascade. And uh, nothing happened with it. Uh, and uh, for all of the previous revivals in our city and its long history, all of the uh, keystone events were primarily within the Caucasian community and the English-speaking world. They all were, actually. And finally, we had a revival that anticipated where our culture is going. <laughs> And, uh, and it was a revival that didn't start with the Caucasian community. It started um, most particularly, as far as we can tell, in the Spanish Pentecostal community, where they started planting churches. Uh, first there was 30, and then 60, then 120 within a year and a half. And then all kinds of other ethnic groups started planting churches the same way. And all you need is about 20 ethnic groups planting churches at that level, and pretty soon you have a change in the number of Christians in the city. It's that dramatic. And then all these churches initially were planted in the worst neighborhoods. And every one of those neighborhoods was changed dramatically. We don't have a major slum in this whole city. We don't have a major deteriorated area left in Boston. We had many at that point. This was one of the worst cities in the world to live in, in the, in the country to live in at that time. Now it's one of the best by many surveys. So the, the result has been dramatic. And not only did it reach the city, but it reached the region and the world. All these ethnic groups were planting churches in their ethnic diversity wherever they were. Uh, pastors uh, that were Brazilian were planting Brazilian churches uh, in, in uh, uh, Australia, <laughs> Sydney, you know, because they had relatives and so forth all over the world. And they were following the patterns of diaspora movements, which was similar to how the New Testament did it. And, the, and, the, and so it began to grow. So more churches were eventually planted outside the city by churches in the city than were actually planted in the city. So Acts 1-8 happened. So you had dramatic social change. You had Acts 1-8 reaching the region and the world simultaneously. And you had dramatic growth of the church happening in the city. And, uh, and so we had the... Uh, Keystone, which was these Hispanic believers initially, and then eventually the black church became very dominant, in the, particularly the 70s and 80s, and grew very rapidly in our city. And, uh, and so this whole thing was happening. But the, the, it was now different because it was not Caucasian-led. And, uh, you know, we have to ask ourselves, well, is this a revival? My gosh, it's not Caucasian-led. <laughs> You know, we have to be able to say, you know, recognize how God is working in the new demographics of our country and, and agree with him in what he's doing, okay? And so that, this, is, um, this is what it, what it happened. Now, uh, you know, this revival is uh, the chart that we often show, of course, uh, is uh, you've many, uh, I'm sure you've all seen this chart, but uh, the uh, population growth is very lightly shaded in there, and this is the church growth graph of how many new churches were planted. And so the number of churches have grown exponentially for five decades in our city. And uh, the percentage of Christians have dramatically changed, the percentage of churches in the entire city dramatically changed, and this was the cascade. The, uh, the, 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 the actual thing of the um, initial keystone thing was not too impressive. It was just a lot of Hispanic churches doing some fantastic stuff, but the cascade was enormous as, it, as this developed and began to spread and spread. And more and more now, we are actually planting a lot of uh, Caucasian churches and English-speaking churches are growing dramatically in our city and are beginning to catch up with all of this. And so the, the church is changing dramatically, okay? Now, 